Pediatrics, Shotgun Q&A. Let's go. Hello and welcome to Shotgun Q&A. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 50 MCQ questions in one clinical course. This is season one, episode two, pediatrics. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Also, drop a comment in the comment section below if these videos are really helping. Share them to a, a friend who is writing exams very soon. And as we uh, follow the rules of these videos, remember that you can pause the video at any point before I give you the answer. Please note down your answers and keep track of your progress and of course count your total at the end out of 50. So we shall begin with question one. Sabina, six months old, is brought in shock. She has had watery diarrhea for the past 24 hours. So most likely, what is the most likely cause? A, Shigella, B, rotavirus, C, Vibrio cholerae, D, Salmonella typhi. You may pause the video right now. And so this is a child that's six months old, okay? And has come in with a history of watery diarrhea and shock. So already... um. Salmonella is ruled out because Salmonella may give you this episodes of alternating diarrhea and constipation. Shigella is also ruled out because you're going to be having a history of bloody diarrhea. So most likely it's either between rotavirus and Vibrio cholerae. Remember that Vibrio cholerae presents you with this rice watery uh, or rice water kind of diarrhea. Rotavirus also is very, very common. It's actually one of the most common causes of diarrhea in children. So most likely it's rotavirus. Question two, Mutale presents with a hoarse voice, a drooling, and a very high fever. What is the most likely cause? A, Bordetella pitasis, C, Corinibacterium diphtheriae, uh, I mean, that's B, C, Haemophilus influenza type B, D, viral croup. You may pause the video at any time, but remember that this is a child that is coming in with hoarseness of the voice, drooling, and a very high temperature. So these are features that are going to be suggestive of epiglottitis and most likely epiglottitis is going to be caused by Haemophilus influenza type B. So that's most likely the answer. Question three, a five month old baby is brought with cough, difficulty breathing and cyanosis despite on oxygen. On auscultation, the lung sounds clear. So what is the most likely cause? A, streptococcus pneumoniae, B, res respiratory sensational virus, C, Haemophilus influenza type B, D, pneumocystis carini. You may pause the video at any point. So most likely the answer here, depending on what the child is presenting with. So you have a cough, you have difficulty in breathing, you have cyanosis. With a streptococcal pneumonia, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae infection, as well as um, with Haemophilus influenza, you may get this um, cough that's often productive, though it may not be so difficult for, uh, or it may be difficult for the child actually to produce the sputum. So there may be some congestion that may be there, but when you auscultate the lung, the lungs are not going to be clear. There's going to be obviously abnormal lung sounds that you're going to be hearing. Respiratory syncytial virus is a virus. It's usually self-limiting. It's not going to present to you with features that are this severe. So most likely that this child has a pneumocystis carini uh, type of pneumonia. Question four. A toddler presents with fever for seven days. His white blood cell count is 2.4 times 10 to the power 3 and his hemoglobin is 7.8. What is the most likely cause? Malaria, salmonella typhi, pneumococcus, measles. So this is a child that has presented to you with a seven-day history of fever. They have leukocytopenia. Um, uh, they also have a low HB. So they have some anemia of some sort. So malaria wouldn't cause a drop in the white blood cell count that drastic. Um, pneumococcus as well, measles as well. So most likely this child has a salmonella typhi. Question five, which of the following immunoglobulins is predominant in breast milk? 
A I G A B I G G C I G E D I G M. This is again one of those things that you just have to know. There's pretty much no explanation for this. So remember that IgM is the antibody that is produced in primary immune response to antigens. IgG is an immune response that is produced in the second is it's the antibody that's produced in the secondary immune response to the same antigen for a, a subsequent exposure. IgE is the antibody that is um, implicated in anaphylaxis. Then, of course, IgA is what's secreted in breast milk, and it's also found in the mucous membrane. So the answer is A, IgA. Question six. A 12-month-old infant presented with running nose three days earlier. He developed high-grade fever. The previous night and this morning, a maculopapular rash has come out associated with conjunctivitis. What is the most likely cause? So A, measles, B, chickenpox, C, rubella, D, heat rash. So what do you think is going to be causing this child to have this maculopapular rash? This child had a runny nose. He had this uh, um, predominant uh, chorizo-like illness before you get this maculopapular rash and before you get this conjunctivitis. So most likely that this child has a measles, okay? So question seven. Uh, a four-month-old a female infant is brought to the emergency services in respiratory distress. Five days previously, she had a cough, runny nose. On examination, her temperature is 38.9, pulse is 180, and the respiratory rate is 80 breaths per minute. She had subcostal retractions and nasal flaring. On auscultation, they are widespread ronchi bilaterally. What is the most likely cause? A, haemophilus influenza type B. B, streptococcus pneumoniae, C, respiratory syncytial virus, D, mycoplasma pneumoniae. So you may pause the video at any time, but I am going to give you the answer or rather the explanation right now. So this is a four-month-year-old, or oh, a four-month child. I don't know why I say four-month-old, four-month-year-old. So this is a four-month female infant. That's what you need to know. The age is four months. So there are certain things that are common at a certain age. Mycoplasma pneumoniae is more or less an atypical cause. So we wouldn't really jump for that answer. So we would remain with Haemophilus influenza type B. We would remain with Streptococcus pneumoniae. We would remain with respiratory syncytial virus. So this child has a prodrome of a, of a cough five days ago and uh, a runny nose. So it means that they had this upper respiratory tract infection before it proceeded to a lower respiratory tract infection. So that doesn't rule out whether it's bacterial or whether it's viral. Now, this child also has a fever, so of 38.9, not so high, a pulse of 180, respiratory rate of 80, subcostal retraction and nasal flaring. And then also quotation, you have this widespread bilateral ronchi. So if you have streptococcus pneumoniae, it wouldn't really give you ronchi because pneumonias usually give you consolidations and these viral pneumonias usually give you consolidations. But with the respiratory syncytial virus, it's most likely that you would auscultate some ronchi because of the changes that are happening in the airways. Question eight, a five-year-old girl presents with a one-week history of facial and pedal swelling. She has otherwise been very healthy. Her urinalysis shows granular casts with no blood. A week later, she is diagnosed with peritonitis. What is the causative organism? A, Shigella. B, Streptococcus pneumoniae. C, Staphylococcus aureus. D, Salmonella typhi. So what is the most likely diagnosis? What's the most likely cognitive organism? I know definitely it's not Shigella. If you're thinking Shigella, or if you've written Shigella, you've already got in the sense of wrong. Um, so definitely it's not Shigella. Do you think that it could be Streptococcus pneumoniae? Do you think that it could be Staphylococcus aureus? Or do you think that it could be Salmonella typhi? So most likely it is Streptococcus um, pneumoniae. Question nine, but of course, in the previous question, that would be up for debate because some people will argue that uh, Salmonella typhi also has the propensity to cause what was presenting in the child. So question nine, a seven-year-old boy is referred to hospital with a two-day history of lethargy, irritability, and poor feeding. On examination, he is pyrexial, drowsy, and has particular skin lesions on his trunk and extremities. His capillary refill time is five seconds, so it's obviously delayed. What is the most likely cause? A. Shigella, B. Nasaria meningitidis, C. Streptococcus pneumoniae, D. 
measles. So you may pause the video at any time. So most likely this child has Neisseria meningitidis. Now, the reason why I'm saying Neisseria meningitidis is because it will give you this characteristic um, rash that comes out whenever there's meningococcemia. Remember that this also runs the risk of this child going into cardiovascular failure where you have hemorrhage that's happening in the adrenal medulla, which is the so-called uh, waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Question 10. The following are as a result of refeeding syndrome in severe malnutrition, except A, constipation, B, tachycardia, C, seizures, D, osmotic diarrhea. Again, we have done a video on malnutrition on the channel, so just go into the pediatric playlist after this and check it out if you haven't yet watched the video on malnutrition. It's divided into two parts. So most likely, refeeding syndrome is... Um, going to be a complication of starting a child on higher calorie feeds. Starting on a child that's malnourished, for example, on F100 as opposed to F75. So the reason why we don't do this is because you're going to cause a lot of electrolyte imbalances in the body. And these electrolyte imbalances in the body can result in tachycardia, they can result in arrhythmias, they can result in seizures, they can result in osmotic diarrhea, but rarely do they result in constipation. So most likely constipation is the answer. Question 11, the following are features of Down syndrome except A, brush filled spots, B, Kaiser flasia rings, C, hyperflexibility of joints, D, brachycephaly. So if you have read Down syndrome or if you have come across Down syndrome, you would know what the answer is. So the answer here obviously is B, the Kaiser flasher rings. And remember that Kaiser flasher rings are actually seen in um, Wilson's um, disease where you have this excess uh, copper and copper is not really metabolized in the body and you have these rings that are forming around the eye. Question 12. In a year old infant, the brain growth in comparison to an adult is approximately A, 50%, B, 55%, C, 60%, D, 80%. This is another one of those questions where you either know it or you don't. But rule of thumb is this. A child's brain grows the greatest within the first two years. So by one year, you should have reached about 80% of your normal adult brain. So it's a, the answer is D, 80%. Question 13, maximum development of the brain occurs during which periods? I've already answered this question. A, infancy, B, adolescence, C, first trimester of pregnancy, D, uh, school going age. So the maximum development happens at infancy. Then... Question 14, periventricular calcification is often seen in the following infections. A, toxoplasmosis, B, cytomegalovirus, C, congenital syphilis, D, all of the above. So most likely it's cytomegalovirus. That's what's going to be causing the calcification that is surrounding the ventricles in the brain. Question 15, cerebral palsy can be best defined as a stiffness of all four limbs in an infant as a result of an insult of the fetal or infant brain b a permanent disorder of movement and posture due to non-progressive insult of on a developing infant brain c limitation in the range of limb movements caused by an infectious process on the fetal or infant brain d a condition characterized mainly by mental retardation as a result of an insult on the developing fetal or infant brain. So take your time, pause the video if you may, but here comes the answer. So cerebral palsy is going to be affecting children that are below the age of two. So these people get a, a, a damage or an insult to the de developing brain, which is below the age of two. And this is going to be a non-progressive issue. So it means it's not going to get worse. It's not going to get better. So it just remains static. And what's going to be affected is you're going to affect movement. You're going to affect posture. So obviously your answer is B. A permanent disorder of movement and posture due to non-progressive insult on a developing infant brain. Question 16. The following are common manifestations of carditis in rheumatic heart disease except... So here they're asking you which of the following is incorrect. A. Anemia is very common. B. Splenomegaly is, very, is a common feature. C. Urinalysis may display blood. D. Mitral valve is less affected. So which of the following is false? How I like to read this except questions which have alternates in them, I just read the alternate question in my mind. So I just say which of the following is not a manifestation in rheumatic heart disease. So most likely 
Remember that rheumatic heart disease commonly affects the mitral valve. So yeah, our answer here would be D. Mitral valve is less affected. Question 17. The characteristic of caput saxudanium include all except. So which of the following is not a feature of caput saxudanium? A crosses the midline. B crosses the suture lines. C easily gets infected if not well managed. D it is diffuse edematous swelling of soft tissue of the scalp. So you shouldn't know what a caput saxudanium is. If you have no idea what it is, then you should be able to Google it after this video or just pause the video and Google what a caput saxudanium is. Then you will be able to know. But it has obviously all these features except it getting easily um, infected if not well managed. So it does cross the midline. It does cross the suture line. And it is, of course, diffuse edematous swelling of the soft tissue of the scalp. Question 18. The following statements concerning cephalohematoma are true except. So you should also be able to distinguish between caput saxudanium and a cephalohematoma. So here they're simply asking you that which of the following is not true concerning cephalohematomas. So A does not cross the suture line. Uh, B, uh, fluctuation is not present. C is due to an ischemic process. D presents a few days after birth. So which of the following is not true of about uh, cephalohematoma? So it does indeed, it doesn't cross the midline, that's for sure. Fluctuation is often not so present. And of course, it uh, presents a few days after birth, but it's not an ischemic process. It's due to bleeding. So most likely, C is the answer. Um, question 19, the following are benefits of breastfeeding except, so which of the following is not a benefit of breastfeeding? A, provides superior nutrition for optimum growth. B, provides more iron than any other food for brain growth. C, provides adequate water for hydration. D, protects against infection and allergies. You may pause the video. So breast milk does actually uh, provide superior nutrition, which is why most children are breastfed or we advocate for breastfeeding even in HIV positive mothers is what we refer to as exclusive breastfeeding where you just feed the child on breast milk for six months then it also does provide adequate water for hydration because usually in the first few months of life the child doesn't take water then it also does protect against infections and allergies because of the IgG that is passed on um, the IgA, rather, that is uh, present in colostrum that's passed on from the mother to the child. So the only other logical answer is that breast milk doesn't have high concentration of iron, okay? Because it has some iron-binding proteins in them. So the concentration of iron is very little in breast milk. So the answer is B. Question 20. The following are manifestations of extrapulmonary TB except A. Meningitis, not responding to antibiotic treatment. B. Pericardial effusion. C. Painful enlargement, enlarged joint. D. Distended abdomen with ascites. So they're just saying all of the following. Which of the following is not a manifestation of extrapulmonary TB? So meningitis it does uh, present with meningitis and it won't um, respond to antibiotics. So that is true. Uh, a pericardial effusion, you may get a pericardial effusion, you may get distended abdominal, uh, a distended abdomen with ascites, but painful in large joints, not so much. Question 21. The disease staging in HIV is important because of the following reasons except A. It provides guidance to disease prognosis. B. It helps with monitoring response to therapy. C. It helps with the choice of antiviral, antiretroviral drugs. D. It helps response to therapy. So they're just simply asking you which of the following are, which of the following reasons is not important for the HIV staging. Okay, and this question should make sense. If there's one question that's very easy in this, it should be this one. So, obviously, for the staging, it will give you a prognosis. The higher the stage, the worse are the prognosis. It also helps you monitor the treatment because uh, the response to therapy, because if you're giving someone drugs, you should be resolving some of the things that are already there. Okay, and of course, the response to therapy, same thing. But then it doesn't really help you with the choice of antiretroviral drugs. What really helps you with the choice of antiretroviral drugs is the type of HIV. So the genotyping. Type 1 HIV is going to be treated with a specific set of drugs. Type 2 HIV is going to be treated with a specific set of drugs. So the answer is C. Question 22. The most developed sense in neonates is A, smell, B, touch, C, hearing, D, sight. 
Again, this is one of the things that you either know or you don't. So most likely it's touch. Touch is the most common developed sense in neonates. But some would argue that hearing is also another quietly well-developed uh, sense in the neonates. Question 23. Of the following, which is not a cyanotic congenital heart lesion? A. Transposition of the great vessels. B. Tetralogy of Fallot. C. Tricaspid atresia. D. Atrioceptal defect. So these are just simply cyanotic congenital heart diseases. Remember that the cyanotic congenital heart diseases all begin with the letter T. You have transposition of the great vessels. You have truncus atriosum. You have tetralogy of Fallot. You have tricaspid atresia. But atrioceptal defect is not a cyanotic uh, heart disease. So the answer is D. Question 24. All of the following are transmitted as congenital infections except A. Hepatitis A, B. Herpes, C. Toxoplasmosis, D. Syphilis. Just simply asking you which of the following is not a transmitted congenital infection. And of course, Hepatitis A is not a congenital uh, infection. It's usually transmitted via the fecal oral route. Question 25. Most deaths due to acute diarrhea result from the following except A. Associated shock B. Dehydration C. Electrolyte imbalance D. Rotavirus infection Again, this is one of the things where you just simply use your common sense. So you may pause the video if you may. Um, shock does kill children with diarrhea. That's why we want to rehydrate them. Dehydration does kill children with diarrhea. That's why we want to rehydrate them. Electrolyte imbalances do cause deaths in children. That's why we want to monitor the electrolytes when they come in. But of course, rotavirus infection doesn't directly cause the death. It's the complication of the infections that cause the death. So the answer is D. Question 26. The following statements about BCG vaccine are false except A. It is a, it is a killed vaccine. B. It is recommended to be given at six weeks of age. C, it is given through subcutaneous injection. D, it provides more consistent protection against TB meningitis than pulmonary disease. All they're asking you is which of the following statements about BCG is true. That's all this question is asking you because you have two negatives there. So remember, two negatives gives you a positive. So you should be able to figure this out. If you're having trouble figuring this out, I think the problem is with the English and not with the medicine. So just simply put this question, rephrase the question and ask yourself, the following statements are true about BCG. That's all. So most likely, BCG is not a killed vaccine. It's a live attenuated vaccine. It's usually recommended for at birth or within the first 14 days of birth. It is not given as a subcutaneous injection. It's usually intradermal. Then it does provide you with more protection against severe forms of TB, like TB meningitis, than it does with pulmonary disease. So the answer is D. Question 27. One of the following types of malaria is known to cause nephrotic syndrome. A. Plasmodium falciparum. B. Plasmodium vivax. C. Plasmodium ovale. D. Plasmodium malariae. So again, this is again one of those things where you either know it or you don't. So most likely here the answer is D. Plasmodium malariae. That's the one that is known to cause nephrotic syndrome. Question 28. The most common manifestation of rheumatic fever is A. Carditis. B. Arthritis. C. Chorea. D subcutaneous nodules so the most common manifestation again here if you haven't read the topic then you have no idea what this is the most common manifestation obviously is arthritis question 29 when considering underlying possibilities for bleeding tendencies such as platelets or proteins one must keep in mind categories of abnormalities such as a quantity b quality c both d Neither. So this is to do with bleeding disorders. Remember that bleeding disorders may be classified as either primary bleeding disorders, secondary bleeding disorders, or mixed or combined bleeding disorders. Primary bleeding disorders are a problem in the formation of the initial platelet plug. For this formation of the initial platelet plug, you need a normal, a normal number of platelets, you need a normal functioning platelets, and you need a healthy endothelium. So if you have a problem in the platelet number or in the platelet quality or uh, in the blood vessel walls themselves, then this may lead to a primary bleeding disorder. Secondary bleeding disorders are usually due to deficiencies in clotting factors. Then, of course, combined or mixed bleeding disorders, it's both uh, features of primary as well as features of secondary. So most likely, you have to keep in mind the quantity as well as the quality. So the answer happens to be C. 
Question 30. There are three common forms of spina bifida. Dash, meningocele, and myelomeningocele. So again, this is option A, spina bifida major, spina bifida occulta, spina bifida minor, and encephaly. So again, this is one of the things where you either know of it or you don't. So most likely here the answer is B, spina bifida occulta. So that's the answer. Question 31. Which of the following is not a complication of severe malaria? A. Metabolic acidosis. B. Pulmonary hypertension. C. Severe normocytic anemia. D. Bleeding disorders. So if you know again the complications of malaria, you would know that pulmonary hypertension is not really a complication of severe um, malaria. Remember the 10 complications of malaria. Question 32. The commonest mechanism of genetic abnormality in a case of trisomy 21 is a non-disjunction of partenal gametes, b translocation of chromosome 14, c translocation of an autosome, any autosome, d non-disjunction in martenal gametes. So the answer here is d non-disjunction. Remember that non-disjunction accounts for over 90% of the cases that we see of Down syndrome. This is where the uh, sex chromosomes fail to split such that in one gamete you have two, uh, two sex chromosomes as opposed to one such that when fertilization happens you end up with three sets of uh, chromosomes at position um, 21. Then Question 33. Management of tetralogy of Fallot includes the following except A. Exchange transfusion, B. Antibiotics, C. Morphine, D. Erythro, Erythrophoresis, um, rather than poesis. So most likely antibiotics, we don't give them routinely unless there's an infection that has been noted. But all these other things, we do them for children with tetralogy of Fallot. Question 34. All of the following are included in the revised Jones major criteria except A. Maculopapular rash, B. A new murmur, which is caditis, C. Migratory polyarthritis, D. Chorea. So remember the Jones criteria, and you would know that maculopapular rash is not a feature that is seen in the major criteria. Question uh, 35. Uh, antibiotics in the management of acute chest syndrome include the following, except A. Cephalosporins, B. Penicillins, C. Macrolides, D. Chloramphenicol. Remember that acute chest syndrome is going to be caused by atypical organisms, your so-called mycoplasmas, and they're going to respond very well to macrolides. Uh, these other organisms can respond to penicillins and cephalosporins, but we rarely do use chloramphenicol as management in acute chest syndrome. The following a breast, uh, I think I've answered this question before. This was a repetition. So, no, it's not. It's a different question. The following are benefits of breastfeeding, except A, provides superior nutrition for optimum growth. B, provides adequate water for hydration. C, protects against malaria. D, protects against infection and allergies. So the only option that has changed from the previous question is obviously C, and that's the answer. Okay, so breast milk doesn't really protect the child from malaria. Question 37. The most important parameter to help detect failure to thrive is A, diet, B, growth curve, C, developmental milestones, D, bowel habit and type of stool. So most likely it's the growth curve. Okay, that's how you know that a child is failing to thrive. Question 38. These are features commonly found in a newly born term infant with uncomplicated Down syndrome except... So which of the following are not seen in the child that's born with Down syndrome? A. Nystagmus. B. Brachycephaly. C. Down slanting palpebral fissure. D. Hypothyroidism. So most likely it's the down slanting palpebral fissure. Usually they are up slanting, not really down slanting palpebral fissures. Question 39. Signs constituting severe malaria include all of the following except. So which of the following is not a sign of severe malaria? A. Convulsions. B. Polycythemia. C. Hemoglobinuria. D. Jaundice. So most likely it's polycythemia. Again, you should know the 10 complications of malaria. If I'm answering the questions too fast, then please comment in the section below that. Slow down in the next video. Question 40. Little Nora, newly born, has extra digits on both hands. The mother says she had the same. This polydactyly is as a result of A an X-linked inheritance, B, autosomal recessive inheritance, C, autosomal dominant inheritance, D, 
chromosomal nun disjunction. This here again, they have given you the clincher, they've given you the diagnosis in the question. The mother had the same thing, the child had the same thing, so most likely that this is an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Question 41, the following unknown causes of oligohydramnios except A, posterior urethral valves, B, polycystic kidney, C, spina bifida, D, premature rupture of membranes. Remember, oligohydramnios is a condition where the is reduced amount of amniotic fluid in the uterus. Remember that during the late trimester, most of the amniotic fluid is going to be produced by the kidneys and the child is actually going to be urinating in the uterus. And yes, you have swam in your own urine at one point and you have drank your own urine at one point. I know it's nasty, but there's nothing we can do. So if there is a problem with the kidneys, you're not going to be producing amniotic fluid. So it means that the levels are going to be very, very low in the uterus. So posterior urethral valves will cause, will cause the obstruction. So they do present with oligohydramnios. Polycystic kidney, same thing. Your kidneys are not going to be producing the, enough urine. It's going to present with oligohydramnios. The premature rupture of membranes, because the membranes are ruptured and this woman is draining amniotic fluid, they'll be losing amniotic fluid. So spina bifida is obviously the answer because there'll be transudation from the open membranes leading to polyhydramnios, which is excessive amniotic fluid. So the following are causes of polyhydramnios except A, paternal diabetes, B, trisomy 21, C, hydrops fatalis, D, renal agenesis. Again, polyhydramnios is just excessive amniotic fluid. Maternal diabetes does cause polyhydramnios. How does it do this? Remember that glucose is actually channeled also to the infant. So if the mother has a high blood glucose level, the fetus is also going to have a high blood glucose level because there is a hormone that's known as human placental lactogen, which actually channels glucose to the infant. So once this child has a lot of blood glucose in their blood, it filters out in their kidneys, then they lose a lot of water. So they have polyuria. So this will lead to polyhydramnios. Trisomy 21 for some reason also has been affect, has been associated with polyhydramnios. Hydrops fetalis also has been associated with polyhydramnios. But remember we say that the amniotic fluid is coming from the kidneys. So if there's renal agenesis, this child will have oligohydramnios as opposed to polyhydramnios. So the answer here would be D, renal agenesis. Question 43. A two-year-old girl well, 24 hours ago, is brought to the emergency room in shock. She has no history of trauma. On further examination, she is extremely pale with an extreme large spleen. Her thick smear reveals no malaria and she is afebrile. The most plausible cause of, of this is most likely explanation of her condition is A. Spontaneous massive internal hemorrhage B. Cardiogenic shock C. Splenic sequestration crisis in sickle cell anemia. D. Hypersplenism. So what is the answer here? So you get this two-year-old child that comes in in shock. No history of trauma. So it means that bleeding, forget about bleeding, okay? She's extremely pale and she has a very large spleen. So that's like the giveaway. You may think that it's an infection, but the thick smear reveals that there's no malaria there. So it means you're not really hemolyzing the red blood cells, but they're being stored somewhere. Most likely they're being stored in the spleen. So this child may possibly have a splenic sequestration crisis in a sickle cell anemia patient. Question 44. Which of the following complications of diabetic ketoacidosis has the highest mortality rate? A. Cerebral edema. B. Hypokalemia. C. Hyperglycemia. D. Acidosis. So most likely it's cerebral edema. Most, more kids die from cerebral edema than any other complication associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. And often, the cerebral edema may be as a result of the management where we give sodium bicarbonate. That's why we rarely do give sodium bicarbonate, especially in kids, because they run the risk of having cerebral edema. So question 45. A 15-month-old child is admitted with severe dehydration as a result of watery diarrhea and weighs 13 kg. She has been successfully rehydrated and is out of shock. Her 24-hour 20, maintenance fluid should be A, 1,300 mils, B, 1,400 mils, C, 1,150 mils, D, 1,050 mils. So what is the maintenance fluid? So remember that we give for the first 10 kg 100 mils, the next 10 kg 50 mils, the, next, the remaining 10 kg we give 
20 mils. So this child, we say 10 multiplied by 100, that's 1,000. So 10 minus 13 means that we are remaining with 3. So 3 multiplied by 50 is 150. So if you add 1,000 plus 150, that gives you 1,150. So that's going to be a maintenance fluid. If you are lost on the math calculation, please take your time, pause the video. You may rewind if you want to go over what I just said, but the answer here would be C, obviously. Question 46. Management of diabetic ketoacidosis consists of the following components except A. Correction of shock. B. Potassium replacement. C. Urgent bicarbonate replacement. D. Treatment of infection. So I think I answered this a few questions back. So most likely urgent bicarbonate replacement, we rarely give that because we run the risk of causing cerebral edema. Remember in the management of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, we use the mnemonic CEPA. S for solutions, for to rehydrate the patient and correct the shock. Um, I for insulin, to drop the blood glucose level. P for potassium, to replace the potassium that has been lost. And of course, A for antibiotics, to um, target any infection that may be present. Question 47. The following signs and symptoms of diabetic mel diabetes mellitus type 1 are very common in children except A, bedwetting, B, excessive hunger, C, weight loss, D, excessive thirst. So here, most likely, you can pause the video right now, but most likely the answer is B. These children rarely show excessive hunger, but they do show these other features. Wet bed wetting is also known as enuresis. Question 48. The following statements are true about meningitis except A. Group B. Streptococcus is more common in infants. B. Fluid restriction at all times due to SIAD, which is a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. C. Steroids indicated to prevent hearing loss when due to Haemophilus influenza. B. Shock is a likely presentation. So they are just simply asking you which of the following is false about meningitis. And most likely we do not restrict fluids all the time because of SIAD. If they are in shock, obviously you'd want to give fluids. So most likely the answer is B. Question 49, we're towards the end. If you haven't yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon, and also let's smash the like button. Let's get it over 100 likes in this video, and you will indeed make my day. Then question 49, which of the following is a clinical feature of congenital rubella? A, a conductive deafness. B, cataract. C, hydrocephalus. D, dental defect. So most likely here the answer is B, cataracts. Okay. The last and indeed the final question, question 50 of Pediatric Season 1, Episode 2. Phototherapy is indicated in the following conditions except A. Congenital spherocytosis B. Neonatal hepatitis C. Rhesus incompatibility and D. Cholelithiasis These are some big words that I'm pretty sure some of you have never heard of, especially with the spherocytosis. So all this question is simply asking you is that which of the following conditions is a, is a cause of obstructive jaundice, okay? Because we do not use phototherapy in cases of obstructive jaundice. So in congenital spherocytosis, you have these um, red blood cells that are looking spherical in shape and they're being hemolyzed. Excess hemoglobin, excess, excess hemoglobin being released, excess bilirubin being formed, it deposits in the tissues jaundice. We can get rid of this bilirubin through phototherapy. Same thing with neonatal hepatitis. You have a problem with the liver. It's not conjugating the bilirubin. Bilirubin retains in the body. Resus incompatibility is also due to hemolysis of the red blood cells. But cholelithiasis is a cause of obstructive jaundice where gallstones are obstructing the biliary tree. So most likely the answer is D. So I will give you now time for you to uh, total your... Um, score out of 50 and what is your score out of 50 grade yourself honestly okay out of 50 and how much have you gotten out of 50 so if you have gotten 45 to 50 out of 50 that's excellent work you are clearly doing the right thing continue being on track if you're between 40 to 45 or 40 to 44 that's a good effort so continue starting smart and take your time to note the subtle changes and the very small things in the different questions the accepts and the false and the true things that you may miss out if you are between 30 to 40 fair enough but you should spend more time studying the relevant material you can actually improve your grade if you're between 
25 to 29, this is an average score. So do not be too comfortable with being a bare minimum student. You could do much better than you are. If you are between 20 to 24, you're below average. So find a way to change your study methods. Maybe start studying with a study buddy, start watching uh, other videos, start listening to audio lectures, actually attend your classes and seek some help if all things fail. If you are below 20, then please seek help. Ask someone to help you out and you should be able to do much, much better than the score that you're getting right now. If you really enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel. But for now, until next time, we do make your dreams come true at MK Medical. Subscribe, share, comment, like to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.